So over to you, Atalanta. Yes, I'd like to welcome everybody from all over the world, and it truly is all over the world. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very, very excited to be um, hosting with World Bicycle Relief uh, this panel around uh, mobility as a human right and uh, a way of, uh, as, a, um, as the missing link in achieving the um, SDGs. Um, it was interesting when I, when I uh, got in touch with Human Rights Watch and I asked uh, for somebody to uh, come and speak to us uh, because we were going to do this panel around mobility, they put me in touch with the disability department. And it was very interesting because, of course, that's the first reaction was, oh, you're talking about mobility, you know, not being able to move. And I said, no, 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 we're looking at it in a completely different way. We're looking at a bit as is mobility as a human right, as a way to allow all people to get to the places they need to get to. And that's everything from education to health to livelihoods to markets. Uh, it's so it covers so many issues. And I think. This is really the one of the first times that we're talking about mobility in this way. So um, I'd like to thank first our panelists who are coming to speak on this subject with very different experiences uh, uh, and well, Bicycle Relief for giving us this opportunity to create this uh, panel. I just say a few words about Giving Women because you may wonder why we're we doing this and what is, what is our role in this. So Giving Women is a, a Geneva-based uh, membership association. We uh, are a women's association and the focus of our work is, is really to work on projects to improve the lives of girls and women basically at the bottom of the pyramid. So this is really what we're, we're looking at. Uh, we do this by um, selecting uh, projects. We have a rigorous selection process, but we are not a grant giving organization. We're an organization that actually works with the projects and help them to capacity build, helps them to fill in the gaps, which are, are preventing them to moving to the next stage of their work. Um, all our members are involved in this, and we have three pillars. We have the core work, which is around the projects, but we have a pillar, which is an educational pillar for our members and the larger uh, philanthropic ecosystem, where we train to really do this job as best as we can. The third pillar, and uh, this panel is part of that pillar, we, be we became very aware of the fact that there needed to be more awareness around the issues that women are facing in, uh, all kinds of issues which are preventing women from moving up and particularly now through COVID where we've seen a lot of slippage in the progress that have been uh, which has been happening to women and so we have done we do a series of panel discussions we do a conference once a year and this gives us an opportunity to bring together various stakeholders and various players to help to bring people together to convene them. So together we can have a greater impact and make greater changes. So we see ourselves as on the one hand, being um, bringing awareness, bringing these issues to the, to the greater public, but on the other hand, being really a, a, a group that brings people together to, for greater impact. So enough about us. Uh, I would like to now uh, introduce Alicia Myers, who is the Director of Strategic Information and Innovation at the Wild, um, World Bicycle Relief. And she today will be moderating this discussion. We, we like to see these discussions in being really very interactive. So we encourage you as the, as the panelists are speaking, if a question comes to mind, please put it in the chat. We will have a, a section at the end for questions and answers, but sometimes we have questions which are very relevant. And if we see them as being relevant, we will pass them on to Alicia so they can be answered by the panelists as the conversation is happening. So we maintain really a, a very natural and organic flow. We're not doing presentations, we're, re we're really talk talking about dialogue. So I would like to pass on to Alicia now. And uh, again, thank you to everybody for being with us today and a special thank you to our wonderful panelists.
Thank you, Atalanti. Thank you for that welcome and introduction. And good morning, good evening, good day to, to all of you that are joining us for this important di discussion. And thanks to Giving Women for um, providing the platform for us to have this discussion. Um, this is the first uh, webinar in a series that we have planned to help raise awareness on the importance of integrating mobility and rural transport into global development to achieve the SDGs. Um, so we hope um, that we have a good foundation for discussion today, that we have a lot of interactive participation, and this will launch um, a continuing dialogue around the importance of mobility and, and rural transportation. So just as an overview for the next hour and a half, um, I'll be introducing our panelists um, and framing the discussion uh, on mobility, we'll look at some key definitions to ensure we're all on the same page as we, as we talk about rural transportation and mobility. We'll have some questions for our panelists and then we'll open up for Q&A at the end. But as Atalanti shared, please feel free to put your comments into the chat. Um, again, we want this to be very much a conversation. Uh, we have such global participation. We wanna draw on your knowledge and experience um, but we will have some dedicated time at the end for, for Q&A. So before I introduce uh, our panelists, just a little bit of background on World Bicycle Relief. Uh, you can go to our website for more information, but we were founded in 2006 and we're committed to helping people overcome the challenge of distance and thrive through access to bicycles. Uh, so we design and deliver a unique Buffalo bicycle. Um, you'll You'll uh, see it out in our countries and, and, and globally where we've distributed. Um, the bicycle is locally assembled and it's provided to rural communities in need of, of transportation uh, to reach services and goods. So it's a little bit about uh, World Bicycle Relief. And I'll now uh, introduce our panelists to everyone. Uh, we have Habiba Mohammed. Uh, she's joining us from Northern Nigeria. She's the co-director of the Center for Girls Education. Um, Habiba, welcome. We also have Andrea Thank Coleman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we also have uh, Andrea Coleman joining us from the UK. She's the founder of an organization called Writers for Health, and she's also a Skoll Foundation grantee. So welcome to you, Andrea. Thank you. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for being invited, me. Thank you. And Wendy is joining us from Kenya. She's an independent consultant currently doing work for CGAP on financial inclusion. And uh, she was formerly the Global Programs Director for the BOMA Project and also a Associate Program Officer at the Gates Foundation. Wendy, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. And lastly, we have Heather Barr joining us from um, Pakistan, and she's the interim co-director uh, for the Women's Rights Division of Human Rights Watch. Welcome, Heather. I think we're quite late on your side of the uh, <laughs> side of the world, so thanks for joining us this evening. Thanks for inviting me. We're having a blackout. It's not it's not the hour. But <laughs> anyway, good to see you all. Okay, well, glad your Wi-Fi is still up and running <laughs> in the midst of the blackout. So welcome to our panelists. If, if you can just give us a little background on your professional or personal connection to global development, just to set the stage before we, we launch into the broader discussion. Do I have a volunteer to start from our panelists, just your personal professional connection to global development, either in your current capacity or maybe what you, uh, one or two line summary from your previous work? Um, I'll start. Um, Andrea Coleman from founder of Riders for Health. Um, I started uh, Riders for Health. I came from the motorcycle community and on a visit to Africa and uh, in fact to Somalia, I was really shocked to see that women and girls and children don't get health care simply because nobody has been trained to run and manage the vehicles uh, that take health care from institutions to them. 
and uh, to make sure that, uh, and, and we could see that vehicles are wasted, uh, lives are wasted, money's wasted, and it was just too much for me to bear. Thanks, Andrea. Mm -hmm. I think I'll go next. Yes, Habiba. Okay. So uh, for me, at the Center for Girls Education, we support uh, the SDG on education, health, and empowerment. And uh, we support uh, girls and young women to move out of the circle of poverty. And uh, majorly here at the, uh, in Northern Nigeria, we have uh, issues of uh, girls not tra uh, transiting from one level of education to another. So there are issues of uh, uh, lack of transition and lack of completion of schooling. So uh, our strength is to support girls in very rural Northern Nigeria and poor urban to be able to go to school stay in school and complete schooling. And that is where our strength lies, supporting them in safe spaces to be what they want to be in life. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Habiba. I see a lot of alignment with what you're doing and also WBR's commitment to, to working with girls to access education. So thanks for sharing that. Can I hear from our next panelist? I can go. Um, my journey in develop, global development started in the late 90s when I was a school teacher in northern Kenya and had my first exposure to understanding what it looked like to work in an area with really low infrastructure um, and low access to services. Um, I spent a long period of time working in philanthropy because I wanted to understand how funding flows in development worked and what it took for big commitments that we hear about to actually translate into impact on the ground. Um, I spent a lot of time telling organizations to go and scale without having a lot of lived experience doing that. And so I spent the past two years working with an organization based in Northern Kenya called the BOMA Project, working on that type of expansion through government partnerships and private sector partnerships. And my interest in global development today remain similar to what they were when I first began the journey in just that, when we think about global development, we need to think about not one solution being the solution, but in fact, when we look at people's lives and the complexity of their lives, we need to understand that the solution set is often a bit complex too, and we have to take time to appreciate that. And that's why this conversation is so relevant uh, today for me at least to speak to. Thanks, Wendy. That's, um, thank you for sharing uh, with us. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll go next. Um, so I, I started my career working in homeless shelters and representing people in jail in New York City, um, and then made a kind of strange transition to working for the United Nations for about um, six years in, in four different countries um, before joining Human Rights Watch. And I actually joined Human Rights Watch um, to work not on women's rights specifically, but on Afghanistan, because I had already been living in Afghanistan for four years at that time. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've, I've been working on a range of, of women's rights issues since then, but have been pulled back very much into the work on Afghanistan because of what's been happening there over the last month and a half since the Taliban took over. So um, I'm really happy to have a chance to try and sort of put my head in a different space and be part of a different discussion here today and really appreciate being invited. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I think we, we can see we have quite a diverse panel in terms of their sectors of work and their geographic location and also their passion and interest. And I think that will help enrich the discussion that we're gonna have around rural mobil mobility and how these all intersect um, when we look at the simple um, issues and barriers that people face from moving from point, point A to B. So thank you each for sharing your stories and we look forward to hearing more for, from you as we, as we move on in the discussion. Um, you may be wondering uh, why this issue is important to WBR. Um, obviously, this is core uh, to what we do as an organization. Um, but what we've learned over the years from our programming is that with bicycles, uh, for example, 
Girl students are 19% less likely to drop out of school after two years of bicycle ownership. This is from um, an RCT we conducted in Zambia. Um, at the same study site, we noted that there's a 28% increase in girls' attendance in school. Um, and this is also um, more than one year after owning bicycles. Amongst rural farmers in Zambia, we saw a 25% increase in their income. Um, health workers in Kenya were retained in service up from 50% to 95%. Um, and we also saw an increase in patient reach uh, from to, to 88% uh, for health workers that are using bicycles. So similar to some of the themes that our panelists raised around access to services, around um, girls' attendance, um, around looking at income diversification, we can see where um, access to transportation such as a bicycle is really making a difference in people's lives, these complex lives to Wendy's point um, and how this is really a critical issue. And we believe that rural mobility and access to transportation are critical to achieving the SDGs, but to traditionally a neglected topic um, in the field of development. And if we actually look at the SDGs, um, there's one metric right now that focuses on rural access. Um, and when there is interest, often that um, focus of resources and time is looking at the development of urban transportation. So we really see rural transportation and mobility as a neglected area in marginalized communities continue to, to be left behind in that discussion. And we'll hear a little bit more about that from our, from our panels. So ultimately we know there's about 1 billion people around the world and about 450 million of those in Africa who are isolated from markets, from livelihood opportunities and from services due to the simple lack of access to transport. So before we launch into the discussion in more detail and, and definitions, let's hear a story from the field around the impact of the bicycle. We've got a short video that we're gonna show that just showcases um, how the bicycles made a difference in uh, the Palabana community in Zambia. Mm -hmm. Every morning, the pulse of life begins in Palabana. We work early to prepare for school. We milk our cows, we open shop. But out here, there are no school buses, no paved roads, no highways. In remote towns around the world, distance is a barrier, time an enemy. But Palabana is a community on the move. Here we have bicycles. Strong, reliable bicycles. Mary used to rise before the sun and walk five miles to school. Now she pedals. Mary dreams of becoming a nurse. Joao travels 50 miles to purchase steel. With his bicycle, he can carry 220 pounds. Joao literally strengthens his community. Georgina is a 68-year-old dairy farmer. With a bicycle, her farm delivers twice as much milk to the dairy cob eight miles away. Out here, bicycles build connections between students and their dreams, craftsmen and their customers, farmers and their futures. I provide fresh milk. I help my family. I treat the sick. I grow my business. I ride to school. I carry water. I care for the children. We are Palavana. We are Palavana. We are Palavana. And we are on the move. Around the world, communities like Palavana are struggling. Struggling to move forward. But a simple bicycle can change everything.
So that, that's a story I think that illustrates very well uh, some of the challenges that we know rural communities are facing with, with transport and how, for example, a bicycle can, can make a difference. Um, I'm curious to hear from our panelists uh, if they can share a personal impact story regarding a change in their life as a result of increased mobility and access to transportation. And, and while we hear for our, from our panelists, We'd also be keen to hear your stories from our audience, um, our global audience. If you can share stories of how access to transportation has made a difference in your life. We'll start with our panelists. Well, I'll go first again. <laughs> um, the, the reason that we started our organization 30 years ago was seeing women uh, being taken to hospital in, in wheelbarrows by their poor exhausted husbands sometimes pushing them women um, in obstructed labor for many miles and being exhausted and still the woman that we saw the first woman we saw died in childbirth a mother um, mother of several children the center of her community and she died because there was no access to transportation and that was 30 years ago, but the picture hasn't changed very much. It is, as you say, um, Alicia, a very, very neglected issue, but it's a, it, it really is something that we at Riders for Health believe is something so important because just as you're saying about the individual getting to school with a bicycle, we know that institutions, ministries of health, hospitals are, are stuck. Uh, health workers, highly trained health workers, midwives, clinicians, not being able to reach the communities they serve and having to walk many, many miles themselves to reach those communities. It's a, it's a really, it's a disgrace in the 21st century. Yes, that's um, critical that people have access, access to healthcare. Um, thanks for sharing that story that inspired you to, to found Writers for Health, Andrea. Um, Wendy, do you have a personal story that you can share where you faced an issue with transport or access to transport or mobility in your, in your personal life? Yeah, in my personal life, uh, I have very clear moments where access to transport was a big issue. When I was out of college and was making a minimum wage, living in Seattle, working at a bicycle shop of all places, the only way I could get to the bicycle shop was by foot or by public transportation, which is not the most straightforward route in Seattle. Um, I didn't have a bicycle. And so it actually took friends that I worked with at the bike shop and people who came together and gave me a 1989 stump jumper frame and pieced it together with other parts. I called it the Franken bike. And that opened up my world. It's how I got around for many years. It's how I enjoyed my recreation and it saved me so much time in terms of how I could spend my day getting to and from work. So um, totally different context, but from a personal standpoint, I definitely had experienced what that barrier is like to not have that mobility. Uh, thanks, Wendy. We'll talk a little bit about the time-saving aspect of, of having access to transportation. So thanks for sharing that story. Um, Habiba, do you have a story around um, personal change or maybe a challenge that you face um, with access to transport? Uh, yes, I do have a story, but uh, it's not a personal story. It's a story of a friend who, uh, because uh, she's a uh, female and uh, because of uh, her father's uh, support for her to go to school, the father bought a bicycle for her, but it was uh, a talk. Uh, it became something that uh, is new to the community because they feel that a woman should not ride a bicycle. Why should the father expose her to uh, riding bicycle? But uh, uh, what the father said is she should always make sure she has a long panties, trousers on, and uh, she should be careful with the road, uh, which uh, she said, was one of those things that gave her courage when she started driving her own car because she's used to uh, the roads and she's used to being independent with her bicycle. 
I don't really know how to ride bicycles, but I have one and uh, I'm trying to ride one now <laughs> at this age. <laughs> That's inspiring to hear. And, and, you know, we know there are also other forms of, of transportation. So we're open to hearing any sort of issue of access, whether it's financial or, you know, public transportation, but that's, that's a great story that you've shared. And we'll also be touching a bit on the cultural issues around use of transportation that um, often face women and girls. So thank you for raising that very important point that's in that observation that you had from your friend. Thanks for that, Habiba. Heather, do you have a story to share with us? Around, um... Um, yeah, sort of. Um, so I grew up in a, in a house in the woods in Alaska, um, four miles from the nearest bus stop. Um, so this is an issue that I feel like I can relate to a little bit, having walked to and from that bus stop sometimes or tried to hitch a ride home from it sometimes. Um, I, I just wanted to tell one other really quick story, which is from a few years ago when I was, I was doing research on why girls weren't going to, like on, on access to girls' education in Afghanistan and, and trying in particular to interview out of school girls and, and their families and understand why they were out of school. And I remember I would sort of take an educational history of each family, you know, each sibling and, how long they had studied, if they had, and, and so on. And I remember a girl who I interviewed in, I think it was in the east in Nangahar province, and um, she hadn't gone to school, um, and most of her sisters hadn't gone to school because, um, it, but, but one older sister, she said, had gone to school, but only for four months. And I asked her, you know, why this, the sister had dropped out after four months, and she said it was because she was tired she was tired of going and I asked a little more about why she was tired and it turned out it was a four hour walk each way to get to school and this girl had actually managed to do that for four months which I think is the miracle not not that she had dropped out in the end anyway thank you thanks for sharing that story I mean that's that is precisely why we think this is an issue that's cross-cutting um, across you know communities women girls, families, um, a four hour walk uh, is just almost unbearable if we think about it, but it's the reality that so many people face. And I'll come back to um, a phrase that we have to, to, talk, to describe that in more detail and how that impacts overall on productivity. When you spend eight hours a day commuting you know, to and from school, that's obviously gonna have um, a significant impact on your energy levels and your productivity, etc. So thanks for sharing that story from Afghanistan. Um, I, I just want to go through, um, were there any other uh, stories from our virtual audience that we wanted to share? So we have one here from Ellen Mindimba, who says, when we were taking bicycles to a Maasai school in Kia, Arusha, the girls were presenting the benefits of riding a bicycle. The first was fitness and health. The second was, and I quote, to not get pregnant by Boda Boda motorbike drivers. Mm. She was in year seven, and I don't remember to have ever had that across my mind when I was that age. It has stuck with me to date and made what we do at ABC Impact that much more meaningful for me. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That was... Thank you. Yeah, so there's a safety um, aspect as well, having access to transportation and being able to move from point A to B safely. So uh, thank you for that story. Any other stories from our global audience? Maybe they can just tap them in as we go along. <laughs> and then yes, we can we're keen to hear more. Sure. Um, so just in the interest of time, I wanted to cover a couple of definitions uh, to, to ensure that we're talking about the same thing. Um, you know, we often hear mobility and transport used interchangeably, um, but as I think as there's more investigation into this area um, and its impact on development work, there's some key differentiations that have been made between the two terms. Um, and I just wanted to share those with, a, with, with our group as, as a background for our discussion. So the first on mobility is, is really kind of the ability of people and goods to move or be moved freely be, between locations. 
And transport is the act of moving people or goods from one location to another. Uh, so transportation facilitates mobility. In our discussion, you may hear, hear me use these terms interchangeably. Um, we often talk about you know, rural mobility, uh, access to transportation, but that's just a, a distinction between the two that you might find useful. There's another term that uh, came across um, my uh, desk a, a couple of months ago that I think has been really helpful framing for this issue of access to transportation and that's transportation poverty or transport poverty. And that's when there's inaccessible or unsuitable transport which negatively impacts a person's quality of life. And, and we know that this is disproportionately affecting women and girls in terms of harassment, as we just heard of this story from Tanzania, getting to school, accessing jobs, et cetera. So it's really the absence of appropriate transportation to facilitate mobility. And I think it's a term that's not used enough, but really helps describe this barrier that people face, either a distance barrier or just access to transportation. There's another term that um, um, Andrea uh, used in a, in a conversation we had, um, which is energy poverty. And Andrea, can you share with, with our audience, uh, our participants today, what, uh, what energy poverty means and how this relates to the issue of transportation and mobility? Yeah, thank you, Alicia. Um, in our experience, um, women in, in rural communities are, um, they're carrying water, they're carrying babies, they're, and often they do so much work in the fields, growing food, uh, walking long distances to health centers to, and girls going to school. And often in those settings, the, um, the, the food and nutrition is not really uh, often available and there's so much um, information and uh, about nutrition that is needed that actually they're often deprived of because nobody can reach them with health education and nutrition education and they're spending so much time um, uh, using that energy but also you know we all know that in pregnancy you need a lot of of energy and, and and often the women don't have that uh, energy because it's depleted by so so much of their work and in addition to that um, th they often have a, a cocktail of, of uh, TB um, malaria HIV and so those diseases are so uh, depleting of their energy and then we're expecting those women to walk to health centers and then there's another aspect of, of health workers who really need to reach their communities. Mm -hmm. They often don't have uh, huge amounts of, of, of food or nutrition, and then they're expected to walk out to those rural communities or to um, serve those people. So that's a huge energy deficit that people are running. One of the women, uh, Jennifer in, in, in Zimbabwe, who, we, uh, who was mobilized with the Riders for Health motorcycle, uh, just, this is one, just one small example. Um, she was used to walking 20 miles to uh, one of her remote communities. And when, once she was mobilized with a, a low, low capacity motorcycle, she, she gained an, a, um, a, a stone in weight, 14 pounds, whatever that is in kilos, um, very quickly within something like six weeks. And, and so you can tell that women in those settings are running huge energy deficits. So that's just my um, experience. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. That's really um, great context to have. Um, so thinking about our nutrition, our general health and well-being, and how those can be impacted by just traveling long distances on, on difficult terrain. Um, Habiba, can you speak also uh, in your context where you see energy poverty uh, and lack of transport impacting the, the work you're doing with schoolgirls? Yeah, uh, I think it's similar to the story that Andrea was talking about. The uh, mm -hmm. issue of uh, girls uh, uh, being overwhelmed with uh, 
trekking long distances to school and coming back to chores at home where they will do uh, maybe fetching of water, getting firewoods for cooking, and uh, for other farm works, farm related jobs that uh, drains uh, the energy. I think that if uh, they have uh, better solutions to mobility, it will really help in making the activities easier. Because uh, sometimes in school, when they give girls homework, they cannot do it because they don't have the time. Their time is uh, very limited. And before you know it, sometimes because of uh, the weight of what they have gone through, when they go into classes, some of them even sleep in class, which uh, is not beneficial for any student. So for me, I think uh, this uh, energy poverty is uh, something that uh, we all need to collectively work on to reduce this uh, circle of poverty so that uh, students can be able to benefit when they go to school and they can be able to reduce the length of the timing that they take to trek to school, which will help them to be able to participate fully when they are in school. Yeah, thanks, Habiba. So we, we can see how energy poverty is, is a direct result of transportation poverty. And perhaps, Wendy, you've, you've done quite a bit of work on, on resilience um, and vulnerability. Can you speak to this issue of productivity um, and loss of productivity as a result of energy <laughs> poverty or transportation poverty, how that impacts on, on resilience and economic development? Yeah, so resilience is a catch-all term, especially it's sort of a, a, a term du jour lately where uh, a lot of the sector is using it and it can mean everything and nothing simultaneously. If you look at the most basic definition of resilience, it talks about a person's ability to recover from difficulties quickly. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a very satisfying definition because sometimes what people are recovering from means they're just getting back to the condition of where they were before, which wasn't a great place to be to begin with. And so when we talk about resilience, we probably need to have a more expansive definition that thinks about what a better tomorrow might look like. Um, in some of the work that I've been a part of around resilience, we've looked at resilience as being supported by three different factors. One is around protection of assets. Um, this is financial assets, these are physical assets, a person having a home, a, a cow, a bank account. Um, it's physical access, it's access to a market, it's access to a healthcare provider, access to a school, and it's knowledge and information to inform somebody. But oftentimes in development, what we do then is we say, okay, you organization, you solve for this part of the resilience equation, you organization over there, you solve for the other part but we don't think about the through line. So we talk about access a lot, but we don't talk about the through line of what it means to get to that access point, which is honestly transportation. And we've all sort of hoped and crossed our fingers that somebody else has taken care of it. And what we find then is these conversations that we're having that for example, with the work where I was working in Northern Kenya, the difference for a woman in lack of transportation to a market was huge for the amount of income she was able to bring into her home when she was selling livestock. If she sold her goods at a local market near her home, which was eight hours off tarmac, she was selling it off to uh, a middleman to sell at a, a bigger market. If she wanted to go to a market where she could get a better profit, she would literally have to walk for three days by herself or with other women to that market at a significant risk to her own personal safety and to the safety of her livestock, her income that she's counting on selling. And so lack of transport in these areas where we don't have infrastructure and we don't have access to reliable transportation can play a significant impact in income generating activity we haven't talked about access to healthcare. Well, we have, Andrea has a little bit. Access to healthcare is significant. And access to schools, like actually how do the kids get to school? What does it mean? And so um, we need to pay attention in the development discourse and not assume that this piece is solved for. World of Bicycle Relief is great, but they are one organization in a world where this needs to be solved at a larger scale. Thanks. You've, I think you've so succinctly highlighted all the complexities um, related to access, um, especially the example of a, a woman work, walking three hours to get to the market and how that impacts on her ability to generate more income. So 
Uh, thank you. And I think we'll come back to that, that example, or at least the intersectionality of these different um, sectors and components when we're talking about uh, transportation as we go on in the discussion. So that was a, a great example. Um, and thank you for that. Um, before we uh, go into uh, some other issues, I just wanted to um, call on Heather to, to speak about the issue of mobility as a human right. Uh, can, you, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the fundamentals of a rights-based approach um, to development and how we should be thinking about this in the context of our discussion on mobility and transport? And I think you are also checking on the Convention mm -hmm. on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women to see if there's anything actually documented around um, mobility or rural transport. Um, yeah, no, thank, thank you so much. I mean, I'm sure that um, most of the folks who are here with us today are familiar with the rights-based approach. It's the idea that, you know, we, we don't look at, um, you know, how can we help people? We look at, um, what rights do they have under international law and are those being fulfilled or not? And if not, how do we um, how do we get people the things that they are entitled to under international international human rights law? And as you've mentioned, um, one of the conventions that forms this body of international human rights law is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And that's um, that convention is kind of the holy grail for the, the team that I'm part of, the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. Um, and so I was, I was, yeah, I was really curious after the preliminary discussion that that we had about, you know, what, um, what that convention has to say about mobility and what the, the committee that interprets the convention has to say. And, and the answer, and I did go and have a look, and the answer is, is very, very little. Um, and I, I think that that's not because mobility is not a human right or a, a right for women. I think it's because it's so inherent to every other right that no one's even felt like it needed to be said. Um, like I, I looked at, um, you know, so there's a committee that reviews um, for each country periodically whether they're complying with their obligations under the convention. Um, almost every country has signed up for CEDAW, this particular convention, um, and yet that committee has not written very much at all on mobility issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think it's I think it's both that it's. I don't think anyone would question whether it's part of the right or necessary for the other rights, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's I think it's there, but it's also not as visible as it should be. I think that um, you know it would it would make sense for this committee when they're reviewing countries to to ask more questions about um, you know okay so you have this sort of education system and you have this sort of economic participation by women and, and you have this system in terms of healthcare or this system in terms of responding to gender-based violence, but, but can women actually make it to these services? Um, and do they have the, the freedom that they need both in terms of availability of transportation, but also things like cultural issues um, and, um, and issues to do with gender discrimination. I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking again about Afghanistan, where you know one of the major issues in terms of Taliban abuses against women is denying women their freedom of movement, saying to women, you shouldn't leave the house unless you have a specific reason to, and specific reasons don't include education and employment because we've taken those away from you. And if you absolutely must leave the house, you can only do so chaperoned by a male family member. Um, so that's sort of the reality of what's happened in the last month and a half. Um, to women in Afghanistan. And when you ask them about the problems women are facing, freedom of movement is always the first thing they talk about. So so there's thanks. A, there's a very interesting comment made by Gail Jennings, uh, where she talks about uh, the fact that mobility is close to being an implicit right in South Africa in their Bill of Rights, uh, which is very interesting. Is mobility an explicit right in any of policies, constitution that for, uh, the fellow participants here know of? That's her question. I mean, I'll try and answer really quickly. If 
if that's helpful. Um, I mean, South Africa is known for having quite an innovative um, constitution, and mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen provisions like that in other constitutions I've looked at, but it seems like a great model that, um, you know, we should all have a look at and, and also consider at moments when countries are, are working on revising, amending, or, or drafting constitutions. Thank you. Thanks, this is great feedback. Thanks, Gail, for that comment um, question. And, and Heather, thank you as well for your um, review of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And I think it's just highlighting for us the need to integrate um, transportation and mobility into policies um, that, that underpin um, human rights. And the absence of it means that it's either assume <laughs> that it's happening um, and it's not explicit, but we can see um, in the day-to-day -day stories that we're hearing um, through our panels and, and from our participants and the work that they're doing, that this is a, a critical issue that's overlooked. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later on in the discussion around um, advocacy and how we can get engaged in raising awareness around the absence of the discussion and the policy framework on transportation and rural mobility. So please, any examples um, and thoughts that you're having about this uh, as we go along, feel free to add those into the chat because we want to make sure that we're, we're considering them in the discussion. Um, so thanks for sharing everyone. Um, just on how we're thinking about uh, transportation and mobility at, at Rural Bicycle Relief is really a, a four-pronged approach. So looking at availability, looking at access, utilization, and sustainability. And, you know, using this framework to examine at, at a community level or even at an individual level, how people are moving from point A to B, what sort of transport options they have available to them. So if I can just explain that in a bit more detail um, in this framework, availability is, you know, is the transportation option available? Um, and then are there uh, available transportation options to connect people to the desired location in a safe and affordable way? And we, we've heard both Wendy and Habiba speak about, and also Heather speak about, um, you know, desired location, safe, affordable. So are all those components um, applicable when we're talking about available transportation or, or are people facing limitations. In terms of access, do, do people have geographical, physical, or financial access to transportation? Uh, so in a recent report, for example, we saw that the poorest often spend up to 30% of their household income on mobility um, that's largely unsafe and, unform and informal and unreliable compared to in developed countries, people are spending closer to eight to 16% of their income. So again, looking at financial access. So people may have something uh, available in their neighborhood, but when you're spending 30% of your income on transportation, that's money that can be going towards strengthening your household, reducing vulnerability, increasing resilience. Um, so how much are people paying for transport and, and it's geographic, um, access. Then on utilization, you know, how are people engaging with the different forms of transportation? So we've talked about the cultural appropriateness and how um, some groups and communities may not be able to use transportation that's available for various reasons. So whether it's a marginalized group, such as those with physical disabilities or challenges, um, culturally it's not appropriate, maybe it's not meeting an end user's needs. So utilization, looking specifically at how people are engaging with the transport available with them. And then finally for sustainability, how is it sustained? Um, so for example, cost of ownership. Uh, someone may have a bicycle, but they don't have the um, access to spare parts or they can't afford to get it repaired. Um, so how sustainable is that, that transportation option? So if I pull all these pieces together, I saw in, in, in the literature um, in my preparation for this, um, an equitable transportation system is, is described as one that allows everyone to satisfy their needs. So irrespective of their income, their age, their gender, their disability, um, and, and also that transportation meeting their needs over a lifetime 
um, over different life stages. So thinking about, you know, is there an equitable transportation system available and how does that relate to, um, you know, mobility and transportation as a human right? So I think a lot of issues I'm covered in the, in the definition section, but we wanna talk a little bit more about um, concrete solutions to this in our panel. I think here, Gail has also, Gail Jennings has also talked about the matter of safety, yes. which is a big, you know, you may have access to uh, transportation, ready access, but the safety part of it is, is one that perhaps we need to address as well. Exactly. So thanks. We look forward to, to more comments around this. I think also what I want to highlight before we um, move forward is just also in development work, we, also, we, we often become siloed in different sectors. So the healthcare sector, the education sector, livelihoods, and, and what um, Wendy highlighted for us is, you know, people have complex livelihoods and how something like the right to transport and mobility is cross-cutting and how we need to approach this discussion um, across sectors, you know, looking at people as holistic and having complex livelihoods and how transportation and, and access to mobility underpin uh, their livelihoods in all different sectors. Um, so let's keep that in mind as well as, as, as we move forward in our discussion. Okay. Thanks. So I think we've highlighted quite clearly that, you know, transportation and mobility are under-resourced in international development, particularly in rural areas, um, and how it impedes gender equality, um, how it impacts on issues of gender-based violence and safety, and how this is um, touching on the lives of women and children, um, how it um, limits people from making their own decisions and their own agency around decision making when they don't have access to appropriate transportation and social exclusion. So there's a lot of issues that we've unearthed around mobility and transport. Um, my question to the panel, and I'll, I'll call on you as each of our participants, is um, how do you think about the role of mobility and achievement of the SDGs? Um, and how can we raise visibility uh, specifically um, as it's affecting marginalized groups such as, as women and girls? So role of mobility in achieving the SDGs. Do you, Habiba, do you maybe wanna uh, share your thoughts on that, especially uh, as we talk about barriers to education and, and those that don't get enough attention for girls? Uh, so for me, um... Uh, the issue of uh, mobility as it's, uh, it relates to the SDGs, uh, we have uh, different uh, rights that uh, every individual needs to uh, understand that this is my basic rights, like rights to education, right to, right to life, right to uh, uh, health. It's also right to mobility because uh, it tells on your health, it tells on your well-being, it tells on your day-to-day -day, uh, activity. So for me, I think that uh, this issue of mobility is something that everyone needs to be able to uh, work towards and see that uh, we ease or simplify it in a way that uh, people will be able to get access to mobility in an easy way without much stress, without much uh, financial burden on people. For example, if you talk about uh, getting motorcycles or cars, for example, there are places you will go that you cannot be able to get fuel or because it's very expensive. But uh, no matter what, everybody should have a way of getting to wherever he or she wants to get to with ease and without much uh, difficulties. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Habiba. Um, Andrea, do you also have some ideas around how we can raise visibility around this issue? Well, thank you, Alicia. I, I'm, I, I mean, I, I really am thrilled about this discussion in, it, in its own right, because um, I've been working on this issue for more than 30 years, and I think this is the very first issue, the time that it's been really raised as transport uh, as it affects women and girls, and also just about the lack of 
uh, rural transport. But one of the things I think is important, as well as raising the the profile of the issue, is coming is is highlighting the solutions we've all come up with because we have come up with scalable, replicable solutions that really can be um, put in front of the UN, in front of uh, the governments, uh, particularly in, in Africa and, and remote uh, areas that uh, geographically have re very remote areas and uh, isolated people. And I think that one of the problems is that people look at rural communities and think that you've got to think about building roads. And that isn't the case. They, th they think about roads and think, oh, huge amounts of money. But actually, if you look at those rural communities, it's getting the appropriate transport and maintaining it well. And maintain mm -hmm. maintenance is incredibly valuable in terms of um, uh, employment. And, and there are, uh, we have uh, groups of women in our programs who are excellent mechanics, excellent uh, managers of, of vehicles. And there's a gender bias even in that, that people think that gender is, that women are not, um, uh, should not necessarily be, not be included in, in the vehicle discussion. So that's why I love this particular discussion. I think we need to highlight the issue, but come up with the solutions, show the solutions that we've all worked so hard to put in place. Thank you. So we have a few things in the chat, which may be interesting as well. One is that uh, having bicycles in some countries put people at risk uh, because of stealing and even potentially killing them um, to get the bicycle. Um, and then in South Africa, again, uh, bicycles gain evident value as transport. There is more risk of theft. Just today, I was explaining to my 17-year-old niece why I would feel comfortable her cycling to me. Mm -hmm. And she then says, why I would not feel comfortable? <laughs> so she meant that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think these um, comments speak again to uh, this framework of availability, access, utilization, and sustainability. So one Andrea's point around sustainability and maintenance of the, the form of transportation that's available and how important that is for continued use. And to Gail's point around the appropriateness of the transportation solution. And I think that again goes back to the question around raising awareness around visibility in the policy side. So if people choose to cycle because cycles are available and they can get from point A to B, how do we make sure that people feel safe and that there's appropriate infrastructure uh, for them to cycle? Um, so I think all of these, again, these issues come together and um, as a community, um, of, of development practitioners, how do we want to address these and, and raise visibility? So keen to hear from our participants as, as, well, as, as well as our panelists about how, how we should be thinking about this. I do wanna um, uh, call on Wendy. Um, Wendy, you had some, you wanted to speak a bit about the climate and climate change and um, how we should also be thinking about this when we're talking about raising visibility uh, around the issue. Can you share uh, your thoughts around that? Yeah, my, my thoughts probably come from more questions than answers. Uh, it goes without saying, and, and probably everybody on this call has seen or been a part of countless either webinars or um, announcements made by uh, philanthropists about addressing climate change with large scale commitments. In about two weeks time, COP26 will take place where global leaders will gather to also talk about climate change and how we're going to talk about climate risks. And the really interesting thing is the people who are most impacted by climate change are the most vulnerable. They're the people that we are talking about who are also constrained by mobility access. And when we talk about 
mobility and alternatives to mobility that are reducing carbon emissions, often that conversation is centered around the northern hemisphere where there are tend to be and, and in pockets of communities where there are more resources to look at innovations. These innovations are not being transmitted down to the communities that we are talking about. And that's a conversation we need to have. Um, the communities that we talk about are often feeling the first effects of climatic shocks. So if you're in a real rural community um, that doesn't have good infrastructure, your community may be cut off by flash flooding, which is something we see happen quite often in northern Kenya. Um, and so there's complete lack of access of transport in any uh, way, shape or form, sometimes for several days. We also have to think about it because there's sort of the present day solution of how we talk about this and what it means to do some research around this. We need to think about it for the future too. Um, I was just in another webinar last week where the conversation was much around Sub-Saharan Africa and the high rate of urbanization that is anticipated by 2050. Well, how are we thinking then about making mobility a right and making it sustainable um, in an environmentally way for the future? And what does it mean to make sure that when we talk about sustainable solutions, that those solutions transcend down to the most vulnerable, again, who are the most impacted by it? So I'm more am bringing it up because I'm not seeing it a part of these global conversations and these global know. commitments. And it needs to be, the, the conversation needs to be elevated. Yeah, thanks, Wendy. That's um, that's great insight on um, another angle that we should address when we're talking about transportation and mm -hmm. mobility, and and how how to ensure that that aspect of the climate uh, doesn't fall through the cracks. So thank you for sharing that and raising those very important questions. I saw in the chat um, uh, a point that you wanted to make, Andrea, as well. Do you want to? Well, not such a mood. Yeah, Sorry, was I'm not sure if someone, how are, were you speaking? Sorry. No, no, I was just somebody uh, accidentally unmuted themselves. So please. Oh, go. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't want to interrupt someone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I think that the, uh, women in, in poverty, women and girls in poverty are, 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 are are at huge risk in all sorts of ways, oh, domestic no. violence and, uh, um, as we say, energy deficit and, and so on. And, and, and I think that arguments about um, issues raised, of co every, you know, so many things uh, create risk, but overall to enable women and girls to have access to transport, whether it's um, people getting to them or them getting to uh, education or health, if if we prevent that or find arguments against it, the risks for them, for the general population mm -hmm. of women and girls is huge. And I, I mean, obviously, I don't dismiss the idea of, of, of risk um, and, and people being in danger, but the, the whole population of, of rural women is, is incredibly at risk for, for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for everything, really. So... I just yeah. don't want to find arguments to not not mobilize women and girls. <laughs> yeah, thank you for underscoring that that point, um, Andrea. I think this is again speaking to um, the vulnerability and the resilience theme, um, and how when people are not mobile, and even to to Heather's point at the extreme end of this, uh, where women's freedom of movement. Um, is prevented, how this is gonna have long-term impacts on, on development and sustainable development, including the SDGs. So I think there's a broad um, foundation of issues to consider when we talk about uh, rural mobility and transportation. We um, just drawing on Andrea's point um, around practical solutions, scalable solutions. We're very keen to hear from our audience as well about key approaches to expand access to mobility and their programming um, and specific examples. Uh, if there, I, I'd love to hear from our global audience as well as our panelists if they've seen concrete programming examples. Um, and if you could share those with us, we are very interested in hearing those. And I, I know, Andre, you've shared a bit about Writers for Health. <laughs> so that's, um, we're happy to hear more, but also 
Um, if yeah. there are other examples, it's really, would really, really be great to hear that. Yeah, and I think if people can put it in the chat box or raise their hand with the raise your hand feature, um, we can also ask the question. Uh, I just want to say something uh, because I think we haven't really talked about social norms in depth. And I remember when the tsunami happened that many women uh, were stuck in their homes and couldn't escape because uh, they weren't allowed to go out without a chaperone. So I think social norms play also a big part as Heather has talked about. And um, my question is, how can we mitigate also? Um, whoever's, can everybody put themselves on mute unless they're speaking? Thank you. Um, and that, that would be my question. How do, we, how do we find ways to really in those moment of crises to help those women? Right. Yeah, thank you, Astalanti, for raising that issue around the cultural norms and appropriate transportation. So I think as we, you know, advocate for policy change or inclusion of, of mobility and policies, it needs to be um, culturally, culturally appropriate, especially, again, looking at this issue of women's freedom to movement. Can I say something? Yes, Habiba. Okay. I'm thinking that um, for me, if there is uh, much advocacy to all stakeholders, that is uh, people in the community, community leaders, religious leaders, and uh, people in government, it will pave way for acceptance of this uh, issue of uh, rights to mobility. And uh, for me, for girls, especially that go to school, this issue of uh, safety, on the route to school. When they go in clusters, not uh, cycling alone, I think it's a way of mitigating whatever dangers are there on the road. It will uh, make them want to be their sisters keepers because they are together and working together and going to places together, even if it is uh, on whatever means of uh, transportation they have. It will help a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Habiba, for that feedback. <laughs> there are a couple of uh, uh, comments in the chat, one from Christina and uh, one from Ellen Mindiba. And both are really stating how um, providing bicycles will really help uh, the poorest communities to reach uh, to, for girls to go to school and for economic growth. And what uh, Christina says, the most effective solution to reverse the climate change, more effective than solar panels or, or as solar panels or electric vehicle. Today's discussion shows that mobility and transport are the building blocks that help connect girls to education and women to healthcare and hence to a better family planning. It's a very powerful statement. Thank you for those comments. Um, and indeed, I think those are, you know, that's really when we're talking about advocating for change and inclusion of rural transportation, mobility and policy um, that <clears throat> there's the safety component of it as well as, um, the fact that it's underpinning all development um, and, and how it's critical to achievement of the SDGs. And you know, this request going as well to donors and investors to prioritize um, mobility and, and rural transportation, increase investment and integrate transport planning into strategies um, based on some of the evidence that we have out there um, and it's linked to um, development. There's another comment in the chat. Um, I, I think that I missed from ABC. Uh, they were giving an example of um, 
their practical solution to transportation? Yeah, they say they renovated bikes from from Vela, uh, Vela Africa to girls in rural parts of Tanzania, and the impact is incredible. More girls going to school, low dropout rates, and better grades are some examples. Excellent. So again, evidence of how transport is helping to retain girls in school and, and also um, improve their performance. Thank you for sharing that from ABC. Great, I think in the 15 minutes we have left just to continue the discussion uh, with our global audience. Um, one specific question that I wanted to raise for the group is around if we could make one recommendation to governments, funders, the UN to change one thing about mobility and global development, what would that be? And I'll maybe start with my our panelists. Um, Heather, do you have uh, thoughts on, on this one, what one recommendation would you present? Um, so I, I think I'll, I'll sort of repeat something I said earlier, which is um, this process where every country that's signed up to the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has to go and report on whether they're complying or not is a, is a really powerful process. And one of the things that um, my colleagues and I did maybe like five or six years ago was we actually wrote a whole um, memo to that um, that committee or actually yeah to the UN about how um, climate change should be integrated into those reviews they should start automatically every time asking questions about um, climate change and how climate change is affecting women and what governments were doing to mitigate the gendered impact of climate change and so on and I feel like you could have a similar solution on this issue where you tried to get this committee every time they're asking a country questions about their performance on gender equality to um, sort of have on their list of things they always ask about um, mobility and, and gender disparities in mobility. Mm. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. That's a, that's a great suggestion from an influencing perspective. Um, and I like the the aspect of it's not just asking, but it's the reporting back on what's being done. So closing the loop as to whether things have actually changed. And I think that's a critical component to raising awareness, bringing forth the issue, and then reporting back on, on, on what's been done. Wendy, do you have any thoughts on this? One recommendation you would make to governments, funders, the UN to change one thing about mobility and global development? 1.5 recommendations. Um, I'll be, I'll <laughs> compress them in one sentence. Um, it goes without saying, we need to take a human-centered approach to mobility solutions. People are not trying just to get from point A to point B for work. They're trying to do it for education. They're trying to do it for healthcare. They're trying to do it for a multitude of reasons. And how mobility is addressed needs to reflect the needs of people who are going to rely on it the most. And the point five of what I'll say is that therefore funders, donors need to provide patient capital. This is not something that can be solved in a three year grant cycle. This is something that takes years because we are wanting to see systemic change take place. And so we need patience and we need money that is also patient to complement that. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Andrea, would you like to add? Thank you. I, I definitely like to echo what Wendy says about patient capital. You know, people expect very rapid solutions to these very serious infrastructure issues. But if I were if I were um, able to address uh, UN agencies and government, I'd say if you're really serious about uh, achieving the SDGs either by 2030 or ever, you're going to have to address the transportation question because people have to get to school, they have to get to work, they have to get to healthcare, and that is not going to happen without transportation. And uh, I want to ask them if they're really serious about this because it's a cross-cutting issue. It affects every one of the SDGs. And um, if we want to do it, transportation has to be addressed. 
Thanks, Andrea. Habiba, any last words, call to action for, for government? Or I for think I agreed with my co-panelists on all what they said about this. And uh, for me, I really see that um, government and donors, donor agencies should uh, look into what will be beneficial to the grassroots so that they will, because this issue of transportation mobility mostly is affecting the people that are much more in the grassroots, that is the poor people in the urban area and the very poor people in the rural area. So if for any reason, the um, whatever intervention coming in takes into consideration issues of mobility, then in very few years from now, we'll be able to at least solve some of, if not all, the problems of mobility. So it's affecting every sector. And uh, I believe that uh, when we take it into uh, as something that is really important, because most people don't see this as very important. If we take it as important as it is, it will help in making sure that uh, uh, people get uh, better health, better food, better education and whatnot, and life will be uh, easier for everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Habiba. We have a contribution from somebody from the audience, Jikontwe Mulenga, who says providing bicycles to girls in rural areas is one of the strategies which can be used on ending child marriage as girls will be kept in school. Some drop out of school due to distance and may end up getting married. Great work to the organizations providing transport to girls and women. Excellent. A practical solution as well as, again, addressing the issue of the impact of lack of transportation on girls and women. Any other um, comments or thoughts from our, our global audience? I think at this point, people can also just unmute themselves. And Oops, yeah. Yeah. Hi, hi, it's uh, Philippine. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, even uh, closer to us, uh, mobility is also, uh, and safety is also an issue for the young girls, you know, uh, in the suburb and um, in some cities. So the safety, you know, uh, the fact that uh, you have no lights, no safe transports, for young girls and our teenagers. So I would say uh, we are speaking of uh, some uh, regions a bit far away, but we can also bring these topics for our cities and our countries. So I'm, I really think that this is a topic which is for all our girls. Yes. And mm -hmm. I'm always very worried when I see girls going back from a party, walking outside, not safe when you don't have enough uh, a light or enough uh, transports. So I really think that mobility and safety is a key element for, uh, for the girls. Uh, I just wanted to bring another perspective, which is not the topic of tonight, but just to have it also in mind. No, I think it's an excellent point and it just shows how cross-cutting the issue is. It's not necessarily you know, rural versus urban, developing versus developed, but especially when it comes to girls and women, the issue of mobility and transportation is, is critical um, globally. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Any other contributions from our, our global uh, audience? Mm -hmm. Just to say, Alicia, that I think that uh, um, increase in transportation and mobility must be linked all the time with road safety and, mm -hmm. and, and maintenance of vehicles, whatever they are, bicycles, cars, ambulances, motorcycles, so. Yes, yes, thank you for that point um, on, on sustainability. It's, um, that's infrastructure and road safety and sustainability, thank you. That's core, we can have the right solutions out there, but um, the maintenance of those 
solutions for longevity is, is critical for optimizing use. I think uh, for me, uh, what's come out of this discussion is that it, this is not an add-on. Mobility is not an add-on in, in terms of education, access. It's, it's central to really dealing with these very, very fundamental issues. And it was interesting for me to hear Andrea saying, I kind of felt, I thought this was the case, but actually Andrea, who's had such a long experience, that this is one of the first times where people are talking about mobility as a, a right and as something that is really the missing link in a lot of uh, the issues addressing uh, develop, uh, the development issues. So I think that for me is really, really a strong statement that we need to keep out there. Thanks, Atalanti. And maybe a call to action um, for any of our participants that want to engage further. As I mentioned, this will be the first in a series of webinars where we'll be talking about mobility as a right. Um, there's also the African Network for Walking and Cycling for those of you that are based in the continent. Um, and there's a rural mobility group that is trying to raise awareness around this issue and has an agenda uh, for how to engage on, on the policy side of this. Um, there's also an organization called Catalyst 2030 that has a transport and mobility alliance as a working group um, in that organization. And then finally, if you're a nonprofit organization and you're interested in learning more or looking for specific tools and practices to embed rural mobility into your program, um, please feel free to reach out to World Bicycle Relief. I haven't spent a lot of time talking about our program in the past 90 minutes, but um, this is what we do. Um, this is what we um, do from an influencing side as well as from a practical programming implementation side. And we're working only with bicycles, um, but are available to help um, you think about this further in your work as well as uh, look at specific um, strategies. And I think Andrea would also be open to hearing for people uh, that are interested in learning more about Riders for Health and the work that they do on training um, people to maintain uh, various uh, sorts of transport and how to integrate it into their programs. Thank uh, you, Alicia, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt you, Alicia. There's, uh, Kyle has a uh, hand raised there. Kyle, if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to follow on Wendy's comment about patient capital, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, part of the, what I'm interested in is how uh, a lot of programs are, are currently funded if uh, there are, you know, less or more successful models that you've found. Uh, it, that, that's a very interesting. Thanks for that question. Um, Wendy, did you want to respond to that? Um, you know, so I think we're still stuck in the re in terms of development and philanthropy of three to five year grant cycles being the norm on how we see funding yep. take place. And it's only unless we see larger scale infrastructure packages, probably mm -hmm. with this tied in, that we'll see it. There are some examples, and I'll be quick because I know we're short on time, of in the research world where we uh, give directly is doing, for example, a 12 year randomized control trial of cash transfers in Western Kenya. And for that, what they did is they didn't have one donor commit to 12 years. They actually crowded in donors to commit for periods of time to fund. So some donors funded for one year, some fund funded for five years, some funded for three years, all tied to different outputs. And so there are some new ways to think about what it would look like to commit for the long run without being so um, reliant on one organization as the source of that support. Thanks, Wendy. That's um, great feedback. I hope that answers your question, Kyle. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, getting there. Uh, but uh, as, as Wendy mentions, we're still in the old model, mostly. Making progress, but needing to do more. Okay, I think we're just at the top of our time limit. I'll just hand back over to Kathleen. I'd, I'd like to thank our panelists for the insightful comments, um, for raising all the different as aspects of the complexity of rural mobility and issues that we need to consider moving forward. And it's been a very, very rich discussion and I look forward to continuing it in the future webinars. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time. 
um, and your contributions uh, across, across the various time zones as well to our global audience. And I'll hand over to, to Kathleen as well. Thank you, Kathleen. Yeah, I'll just say a couple of logistical things and then I'll, I'll probably let Atalanti close off as we often do. Uh, but just uh, to let you know that, you know, we will share the recording from this event. We just do a little bit of editing and it will be available in the coming days and we will email you uh, when it is up on our Vimeo channel. And also we will, uh, we sort of go in and, and capture also what comes in the chat box and, and share that and maybe some additional resources will be shared in that follow up mailing that will be in your inbox sometime next week. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, I'll just pass it on to Atalanti to close us off here. I guess I can not see myself. Um, I, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Thanks for our very active audience and your comments, because that really kept the discussion alive. Alicia, thank you for doing a great moderating job. And thank you to our panelists for the, your honesty and the way that you address the issue. I think this is an issue that I think we need to really move forward. Clearly, it's not being discussed enough. And maybe this is the beginning of a, a movement on mobility as a human right. So um, watch this channel and uh, have a good evening. Thank you so much, everybody from every part of the world that you are for joining us tonight. And thank you to World Bicycle Relief for giving this opportunity to discuss this issue on a much greater, uh, broader um, aspect. Thank you very much. Have a great evening or day or night or whatever. <laughs> you can all Thank unmute you. yourselves and Thank maybe you. take your cameras off. We can all say goodbye to each other. Thank you. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Have Thank a good you. evening, Bye. afternoon, morning. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Habiba. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Abiba. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, everybody. Hi, Heather. Thank you so much.